Okay, so this is going to be session four of the class, Understanding the End Times. And we're still in part one, uh, Scoffers and Doctrines of Demons. And in the last session, we kind of gave an overview of the Seven Mountain Mandate. And what I did in that session is I listed, you know, what it is and what's good about it and where I agreed with it and just kind of gave an overview of exactly what the Seven Mountain Mandate, the Seven Mountain Teaching is. Um, and I describe, you know, you can't categorize all seven mountain teachers into one category. There's nuance. They don't all fit in the same thing. There's some who use it as a strategy for the church to be salt and light. And I say, that's awesome. That's great. I completely agree with that. Um, but it, the, the problem where the seven mountain teaching comes is in the uh, medium to serious era. But it becomes very serious when it becomes a doctrine, especially an end-time doctrine of eschatology uh, where you blend together partial preterism and postmillennialism. And that's what kind of we, we talked about in the uh, session three. Now, in this session, I'm going to go through and give, talk about nine specific errors of the Seven Mountain Mandate, which I believe are errors. I believe they're, they're errors that form together, create a doctrine that I don't believe is scriptural, and I don't believe it's what the scriptures teach. So we're going to dive into that. And just as a reminder here, as I quoted in the last session, uh, theologian Donald A. Carson, and he said, uh, he attributed this to his father, that a text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. In other words, when a teacher removes a scripture from its original context and uses that outside of what the author intended, and that this is major in the charismatic church, Big error. This is, this is happening all through. We're going to talk about some of these in this class, but this is happening all throughout the charismatic church. Taking a scripture out of context, out of what the author intended, out of the historical setting, out of the culture of the day, out of what the audience would have understood, and applying it to a preconceived doctrine, and that, that then becomes a proof text to, to support a doctrine that really is not scriptural, and it can actually become what Paul described as a doctrine of devils. That is a doctrine inspired by demons to lead people astray, to lead them away from the Lord himself. So it's serious stuff once we get into the blending of partial preterism and postmillennialism. <clears throat> and so theologians have come up with the term exegesis and eisegesis to um, explain this phenomenon. And I'll, I'll just give you a quick definition. And again, I'm not trying to use big words, but it's, it is important when, when you, you come into this that exegesis is a legitimate interpretation which reads out of the text what the author, the original author intended in his meaning. Eisegesis, on the other hand, reads into the text what the author wants the text to say to support their preconceived doctrine. And so what happens is, when it comes to the error of seven mountain teaching, many teachers, uh, they move from exegesis to eisegesis to reading into the text their preconceived doctrine. In other words, the idea that the seven mountains are going to be conquered by the church in a great revival where, where a billion are saved, there's signs, wonders, and miracles. Now, again, I believe a great revival is coming, and I believe God is going to release signs, wonders, and miracles. I believe all that, but I don't believe it's for the transformation of nations. I believe it's for the transformation of the bride. That's a big, big distinction there. But they read into that and say that Jesus is not coming back until the nations are transformed and they, and they take that idea and they bring it into Scripture, and this is where I, become, I believe it comes error. The first one we're going to talk about is, uh, the, the, the first error is, number one, the seven mountains on which the harlot sits do not refer to the seven mountains of culture. Some seven mountain teachers will say, they'll say something like this, as you get to Revelation 17, 9 through 10, and you see a woman sitting on seven mountains, and they'll just quickly just say this. The seven mountains are the seven mountains of culture. They are, you know, we've listed them, government, education, family, religion, media, arts, entertainment. Um, and so they say that these seven mountains of culture uh, that the woman sits on, she sits on seven mountains, 
that these seven mountains are the seven mountains of culture. And they said, we've got, the church has to conquer this harlot and take back those seven mountains. And let's just read the scripture as Revelation 17, 9 through 10 is, Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and they are seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must remain a little while. And so again, they, they take it completely out of context. There's no, there's no scripture in Revelation 17 or Revelation 18 that's, that you could, you could draw, you could extrapolate and say the seven mountains on which the woman sits are the seven mountains of culture. There's no way you could make that. There's nowhere in other place in scripture that you could make that. So to say that the Bible teaches there are seven mountains of culture is error. It does not teach that. Now, again, that there are seven mountains of culture, you could say. There might even be more. But, and we should influence them. We should impact them. But the scriptures do not teach that. that that's where a big error comes is to, is to say the Bible teaches that. It does not teach that. It does not teach that. And so we're going to look at in later sessions what I believe the seven mountains are. But just to say, it does, the, the seven mountains the harlot sits on are not the seven mountains of culture. So it's taken out of context. The second, the second error that I believe is in the seven mountain teaching is Genesis 120, the, the Genesis 128 mandate. I'm going to read it here in the King James Version. And you're probably familiar with this, but God blessed them and God said to them, talking about Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And so I want you to notice that the key word that I use is dominion, dominion, take dominion over the earth. And so seven mountain teachers who also embrace dominionism, or you know, I'm going to use that, which is a synonym of postmillennialism. Dominionism is they quote Genesis 128 and say, "Take God has told us to take dominion over the earth." Well, to them that means take dominion over the nations, take dominion over people, take dominion of cities, take dominion of nation of, the, of a nation, take dominion of the nations. The church is the ecclesia of the government of God, and the church is called to take dominion over the nations. The problem is that text, Genesis 1, 28, does not talk about taking dominion over people or over nations. It says, take dominion over the fish, take dominion over the birds, take dominion over the everything that moves. In other words, take dominion over the animal kingdom. That's what that's talking about. It does not mean take dominion over other people. It does not mean take dominion in a city, take dominion in, in a nation or in the nations. It does not mean that. And so to use Genesis 128 as a proof text that the church is called to take dominion of the nations is simply not, is really an error. So it's a misconstruction of what that text says. Number three, the Great Commission, this is what they, they claim, the Great Commission is a call to disciple, or let me say it this way, let me say it this way. Uh, number three, the Great Commission is a call to disciple people not the systems in nations. The Great Commission is a call to disciple people, not the systems in nations. Matthew 28, and you'll hear it frequently, and it just they, they say it so often, you know, it's never really pushed back on, but you know, they, they quote the Great Commission. You, you, I'll read it here out of Matthew 28, 18 through 19. Um, all authority, Jesus said this, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so what a lot of seven mountain teachers do is they break away from centuries of traditional interpretation. What the church, what the apostles clearly understood and the church, early church fathers and really even most church fathers have understood is that we are not, we are called to make disciples of individuals not nations. You, you don't see any example of Paul or Peter or John or any of the other apostles, or even Jesus, making disciples of entire nations. You see them making disciples of individuals in the nations. And so seven mountain teachers claim that the Great Commission 
It is a call for the church to exercise Christ's authority over the systems that establish culture in the nations, namely the seven mountains. And so what you hear sometimes in this, in this teaching is that, you know, he is called as an apostle to the mountain of government. She is called as an apostle to the mountain of media. Or he is called as an apostle to the mountain of education. And, and they use this terminology uh, based on the Great Commission. Um, but my question, you know, and, and, you know, they often use Daniel and Joseph as an example. And I agree, Daniel and Joseph are a great example of what we should be like in culture is that we should be serving God and not bowing the knee to any idol or anything in culture. But the thing is, is, that, is, the, is the teaching is we need to affect the mind molders in the nations, those who sit on the top of the mountains, we need to influence them. We need to penetrate all the way up into these areas of these mind molders in the nations if we want to see a nation transformed. Now, again, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that's a bad thing to do. I mean, obviously, if we can, if we can reach those that are, that are sit in the, mount, that the high mountains of government and high mountains of education and all those mountains we're talking about, if we can influence them for Christ, that's awesome. That's awesome. I'm all for that. The error, in my opinion, is do we ever see Daniel transforming Babylon that way? Do we see Joseph transforming Egypt in that way? And I'm not trying to be uh, snarky here, but I mean, really, did, did we see that? I mean, God has a lot of really bad things to say about Babylon and by the prophets, and God has a lot of bad things to say about Egypt and the prophets. And so though we're called to be salt and light that influences culture, and even those that, that are higher up in influence, that's awesome. But that's no guarantee that it's going to transform a nation. And I mean, if it does, that's awesome, but that's not a guarantee. I mean, did the apostles really transform Rome or Israel or Laodicea or any of that? We don't see any, any example of that. What we see is individuals impacted, and the individuals who are impacted then transform wherever they are. They influence the nations or the, the cultural area that they have been planted so the question is this, was Jesus really talking about transforming the systems that shape culture when he gave the Great Commission? I think the, the best way to answer that is that we go back to the original context and Jesus said to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And now seeing how the apostles water baptized their converts, we know that Jesus was talking about water baptism. So the question is, can you baptize the mountain of government in America with water? No. Can you baptize the mountain of education in England? No. Obviously, that is not what Jesus was teaching in, his, in the original context was to disciple the systems of nations. He was talking about the individuals in the nations. So it's important that we understand that because that really is not true, that we're called to disciple the systems and nations. And again, if we influence the mind molders and the influencers that shape culture, that's awesome. But that's not what Jesus was saying in the Great Commission. He was saying, given in commission, go and teach in, the, in my name and baptize the individuals in nations. Number four, the gospel of the kingdom is not a call to conquer the seven mountains of culture. And a lot of seven mountain teachers will take Matthew 24, 14, where Jesus said, The gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. And what they do is what they say is the gospel of the kingdom. It goes far beyond preaching Jesus is king. He has a kingdom, and his kingdom is coming. It goes far beyond that, and they interpret it to say, that, the, that Jesus is restrained from coming from heaven to earth. He's restrained until the, the gospel of the kingdom is preached and the nations who hear that gospel submit to the gospel are transformed by the gospel and, and those nations become Christianized. That, that is not, I don't believe that's what he's really saying. Not at all. Notice carefully what Jesus said. He said, this gospel of the kingdom should be preached as a witness, as a witness, not to take over. I don't believe the Lord is going to take over any nation until he comes back. 
This gospel of the kingdom is to be a witness. This gospel of the kingdom is to say Jesus Christ is king. Jesus Christ has a kingdom. Jesus, the kingdom of God is within his people and it's expanding from his people. And the kingdom of God is coming to the earth in his return. That is the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom in all the nations as a witness, not for the kingdom of God to take over a nation or nations and present it to the Lord as his dowry and present it to the Lord as a wedding gift that we are, here's the nations you have longed for. I do not believe that's what scripture is teaching at all, at all. We are not called to, to take dominion, invade and conquer. That language is actually really scary. You can just look at church history and see what happens when the church is so intertwined with government. Just look at the Middle Ages and church history. It does not end well. And so, anyway, I do not believe that is what Scripture is teaching, not at all. Number five, the, the church is not called to occupy until Jesus comes. Now, this might shock you if you've been hearing Seven Mountain Teachers let me say it again. The church is not called to occupy until Jesus comes. Okay, seven mountain teachers. And again, this does not mean we're not called to be salt and light. We are. Seven mountain teachers quote Luke 19, 13, but they quote it in the King James Version. And this, this version says, occupy till I come. And so the idea means is that the church is meant to occupy the seven mountains of the culture. The church is meant to occupy government, occupy media, occupy education, all that stuff. Again, we want to be influenced. We want to be influencers. We want to impact. We want to be salt and light. All that. But we are not called to occupy. We're not called to take dominion in those areas. Now, here's the problem is when you first read that, you're like, what the scripture says, occupy till I come. Isn't that what it means? Well, you got to go into the Greek. And, and in fact, I used to quote this quite a bit myself until I actually said, you know, I should go back into the Greek and actually look what that Greek word means. That Greek word occupy, it means be occupied by doing business. It does not mean occupy in terms of dominion. So what, that, what the Lord is saying here is he's saying is be about the Lord's business. Be occupied spending your time doing the kingdom work, using your skills, using your talents, using whatever God's given you, using what influence God's given you, using the money and the finances he's given you. Be occupied doing the kingdom business as a servant wherever God has placed you. And then if you're faithful, go back to the context of Luke 19. If you're faithful, then... If you're faithful doing the Lord's business, then you will rule and reign when he comes back. See, it's totally reversed. Is We are not to occupy and take dominion in, in different areas of culture. We're to do business in the areas of culture. We're to be occupied with the kingdom. And then if we're faithful, the Lord will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Because you were faithful in this very little thing, have authority over five cities. Have authority over ten cities. That's when Jesus comes back. Just read the whole uh, section, the parable there, and you'll see it. So ruling and reigning, just listen. Ruling and reigning with Christ comes after Jesus returns if we are faithful doing business in the area God's place us. Again, that does not mean we don't have authority now. We do have a measure of authority. We have authority over demons. We have authority over sickness. We have authority in the measure of, that's of Christ that is formed in us. We do have a measure of authority. But the ruling and reigning over cities and nations comes in the millennial kingdom when Jesus comes back. Number six is the restoration of all things. And this is out of Acts 3, 20 through 21. The restoration of all things pertains to Israel and not the church. And again, you'll hear it. Uh, I'm just going to read the scripture, Acts 3, 20 through 21. That he may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. And so a lot of seven mountain teachers will say, well, or some seven mountain teachers will Take this scripture and they'll paraphrase something like this to, to, in what they say. Is they'll say Jesus, based on the scripture, says 
and he says that he may send Jesus Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until. And they call it the until factor. And they say that Jesus cannot return until everything is restored. This restoration is described, this is what they say. This restoration is described by the Old Testament prophets. And they'll list two examples. One example will be uh, Isaiah 11:9, saying that the glory of God is going to cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. And Isaiah 2, 2, that the mountain of the Lord's house will be established as the chief of the mountains and all the nations will stream to it. But is that really what Peter had in mind? Is that really what Peter had in mind, that there would be this massive revival that would cover the entire earth and the glory of God would cover the entire earth apart from Jesus Christ being on the earth? I, I don't think so. I don't think it's going to come through the church. I think what ha was happened is a lot of these interpreters, again, what we said, they take a verse of Scripture out of context. The Old Testament prophets were writing to the nation of Israel. And God is describing the restoration of Israel when Jesus comes back. When Jesus the Messiah returns, they're describing the restoration of Israel. In other words, what, what Peter is saying here, he's saying repent and return because when, basically I'm going to paraphrase it, when the restoration of Israel is underway, then Jesus can come back. And we're seeing the restoration of Israel. Beginning in 1948, one of the greatest miracles in history, Israel became a nation after almost uh, over 1,800 years of desolation. Jerusalem was captured in 1967. The restoration of Israel is underway, meaning Jesus is coming back soon. So what happens now, this is a, bit, this is a huge error in the charismatic church and really a lot of the church, is replacement theology where we say the church has replaced Israel in God's prophetic plan. We're going to deal with that in the next session, but I'll just say it right now, is if you can look at, and we're going to look at this in, in great detail in the next session, throughout church, church history, is whenever teachers and Bible teachers take the Old Testament prophets and they cherry pick it here and cherry pick it there and remove it out of context and form a doctrine, is this replacement theology always leads to some form of anti-Semitism. Just throughout church history, you can see it. We'll look at it in the next session. And so what's happened in the charismatic church is we have embraced replacement theology to say the church has replaced Israel and God's prophetic plan. The church has replaced Israel and what, what God wrote in uh, the Isaiah in Jeremiah when he said Israel, well, he was actually talking about God's people, the church, the true Israel. There's a lot of error. I'm going I'm to go into that in the next session that we need to look at. But when, when you have replacement theology and you come to Acts 3, 20 through 21, and you say until the prop, what the prophets spoke, and you say the church must then release a great revival so Jesus can come back, or the church must release this great revival so the mountain, the nation streamed to it, Isaiah chapter 2, you get into some real serious error. See, Hitler even used Martin Luther's replacement theology to persuade the Germans of the necessity of the final solution. That's how bad it gets. You want to be very careful. What Paul warned the church in Romans, don't be arrogant towards the branches because... Or, or don't be arrogant towards the root because the root supports you. It's not the other way around. So we want, to, we want to really, when we interpret Scripture, especially the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah, Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Malachi, we want to make sure we're not committing the error of replacement theology. Now let's, let's just for a second, let's look at these two Scriptures for a second and, and just ask is this really what, is the seven mountain teaching really what uh, the prophets intended? So Isaiah 11 verse 9 is seven mountain teachers claim the earth is going to be full of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Uh, Isaiah 11 verse 9. So th what they say is that this prophecy will be fulfilled by a massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit with great revival and great miracles and, you know, the nations, everyone, basically the nations are going to be Christianized and the glory of God is going to cover the earth. Now, this is prior to Jesus coming back. Well, 
Let's actually go to the original context. And you see here in Isaiah 11, 4, just read the whole chapter of Isaiah 11. And you'll see, okay, there's a lot of, of scripture twisting to come away with the interpretation that it's a great revival that leads to that. I believe it's when Jesus comes back, the glory of the Lord will shine across the earth. But in Isaiah 11, 4, uh, it says in that very same context, it says the Messiah we know is Jesus. He's going to strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and he's going to destroy He's going to, or so with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. This is actually a quote Paul uses in 2 Thessalonians 2.8 to talk about Jesus destroying the Antichrist that is coming. Now here's another one, another part of this context. Is we see in that very context that the wolf is going to lie down with the lamb, and the leopard is going to lie down with the young goat, and the calf is in the young lion and the fatling together. The cow and the bear will graze. Their young lion will lie down. Um, the nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. In other words, if we're going to claim that a great revival is going to bring the glory of God to cover the entire earth, then we also have to say that scripture will be fulfilled. Now, that would be awesome. I hate snakes. That would be awesome if that was true. I mean, I can't, the snakes just creep me out. But I don't expect a great revival to come and reverse the curse off snakes or the animal kingdom. That's coming when Jesus comes back. So again, it's taken completely out of context, not considering the whole chapter, the book. And uh, it's, it's basically just cherry picking that, that scripture to form a doctrine. So the next thing, and, 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 and the next scripture verse they use is Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. You, I, I hear this all the time. I hear it all the time by charismatic preachers. And they'll, 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 I'm going to read it, just Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. Is, is they, they quote this, and they say, the church is going to be at the top of the mountain. I'm going to read it here. Let me get my, my uh, Isaiah chapter 2. And you probably have heard this as well. Now it will come about in the last days, certainly you're living in the last days, that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. And many people will come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways. And you've heard that, but so... A lot of charismatic preachers will say, God is raising up the church to be the chief of the mountains. We are no longer the, we are the head but not the tail. We are the head but not the tail. God has called the church to be at the top of the mountain. And so the nations are going to stream to the church before Jesus comes back. Here's the problem. Look at what Isaiah said one verse earlier. Isaiah said, in the original context... Isaiah said, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amoz, concerning Judah and Jerusalem. The prophecy is not about the church. It's about Israel when Jesus comes back. When the Messiah comes back, Jesus Christ. So, in other words, that error that says that the restoration of all things spoken by the prophets, meaning is before Jesus comes back, there has to be a worldwide revival that the glory of God will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. But I mean, I, I, again, I believe a revival is coming, but it's not to transform nations. And that the church is going to be raised up as the chief of the mountains and all the nations are going to stream to it. There's no way you can believe that and believe in a uh, literal interpretation of the book of Revelation. You have to embrace partial preterism, and that the book of Revelation was either interpreted symbolically and not literally. I mean, there's obviously, of course, a tremendous amount of symbolism in Revelation, and we'll get into that later. But th the point is, is you have to embrace partial preterism and post-millennialism to arrive at that idea. So I believe that Isaiah chapter 1, or actually, you know what, I read Isaiah... I, I, yeah, sorry, I should have read Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1. But I believe that what Isaiah is describing is not the, the way the church is going to look before Jesus comes back. I believe he's describing what Israel is going to be like 
when Jesus comes back. It's a huge, huge paradigm shift. But anyway, I encourage you to go in that yourself and look at it yourself. Okay, the seventh thing that seven mountain teachers, or the seventh thing, the seventh error, I believe, of the seven mountain teaching is the church is not going to make all of Jesus' enemies his footstool. So again, a lot of seven mountain teachers say that Jesus cannot come back until, and they, they use that word again, the until factor, until the enemies of God are, are uh, crushed underneath the foot, the feet of the church. And so they, they quote Psalms 110, verse 1, the Lord says to the Messiah, sit in my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. They stress the until factor. That is, Christ can't return until the church subdues all of Christ's enemies. And so one, one prominent seven mountain teacher said this is, this passage is intended to shape our eschatology. Together with Acts 3, what we, we just looked at that, um, it gives us critical information about God's timing, the until factor. In essence, the Father says to the Son, once you purchase redemption for mankind, you will sit in my right hand, you will have done your part on earth till I make your enemies your footstool. You will remain up here as the head and your body on earth will crush your enemies. The last generation will be the foot generation and will rule on the earth over your enemies. Until they do so, you are not going to back to rescue, rapture, save, or anything else. Your body, in fact, will not be a beautiful bride until she has accomplished this crushing of Satan. So the question is, it's a question, where in Psalms 10, Psalms 110 verse 1, where in Psalms 110 verse 1 does David, the writer of that psalm, say the body of Christ will make Jesus' enemies his footstool before he can return? So just to be clear, that this particular teacher sees this crushing of the Lord's enemies to be the Antichrist, the false prophet, and, in, and, and the harlot Babylon. So I don't see any place in the original context, even in, even in the light of New Testament revelation, I don't see any place where it says the church, the, the body of Christ, by the authority given to us, is going to crush the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the harlot. I don't see that at all. In fact, I see the exact opposite when I read Scripture. Jesus Christ, read it, Revelation 19, 20. Jesus Christ at his return is the one who cast the Antichrist and the false prophet into the lake of fire. And in fact, it's the Antichrist who destroys the harlot Babylon, Revelation 17, 16. It's not the church. That's not an accurate teaching. And so... Paul brings this I now now I do believe thou I do believe that the church will conquer some of God's enemies before he comes back and I'm talking mainly powers and principalities um, but I, but you know like Paul said the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet so there will be the church of the end times crushing demonic powers under our feet I absolutely believe that for sure but it does not mean Jesus is constrained from returning in heaven until every one of God's enemies is crushed. That's post-millennial doctrine. I do not believe that's accurate. Uh, I'm not going to read this whole scripture, but you can look at how Paul used uh, this Psalms 110 verse 1. It's in the notes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 22 through 27. Um, just to make it really, really simple, when the Lord vows, I will make your enemies a footstool for your feet, Paul brings this into the New Testament light and if you read the whole thing, you can look at it in the notes. We see that it is Jesus Christ himself who does the subduing and the abolishing when he comes back. So, in summary, the church will overcome some of Jesus' enemies before he returns, but not all of his enemies before he returns. And in, in sharp contrast to the seven mountain teaching, Jesus is not waiting to return until the nations have been conquered by the church. On the contrary, Jesus is waiting until his bride has made herself ready. That's a big, big distinction. Huge. Number eight. 
is the kingdoms of the world do not become progressively Christ's kingdom. The kingdoms of the world do not progressively become Christ's kingdom. That's a huge teaching in partial preterism and dominionism post-millennialism. Is a play, uh, Seven Mount teachers put a big emphasis on Revelation eleven fifteen, that says that now the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. In other words, there's this what they say is the kingdom of God is increasing, and it is increasing, but it's increasing within a people and in the influence God's given to those people. But it doesn't mean that all the nations are coming under the influence of the kingdom before Jesus comes back. If you, if you go into, uh, in, in fact, if you're going to really interpret Revelation 11:15 to mean that, you're going to have to do a ton of just twisting of Scripture, taking it out of context to make that fit. Because if you read Revelation 11:15 in the original context, and, and I've read what uh, certain partial preterists have tried to make that fit, where they say the law and the... the uh, the two witnesses are the law and the prophets. I mean, it's really, really confusing. I mean, it is just, you end up with some crazy, crazy stuff because I don't believe that's what the Lord's saying. What, I believe what the Lord is saying in Revelation 11, in the context, you see two witnesses, Elijah and Moses, they're, they're, uh, they witness in Jerusalem for the last three and a half years of the age and the Antichrist kills them, but God raises up in three and a half days. Um, and, and so anyway, the the the... The thing we see here in the context of that, in context, is that we see in Revelation eleven fifteen. in context, is after the two witnesses are raised up to heaven, it says, then the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. In other words, the, the kingdom of God does not take over the nations progressively by a revival the kingdom of God takes over the nations suddenly by God's end time judgments. Now go back and just go back and read Revelation 11 in the original context, not using a bunch of super spiritual symbolism that just gets wacky. And, and to me, what it's saying very clearly, there will be two witnesses in Jerusalem. They will prophesy for the last three and a half years of the age in Jerusalem and these two witnesses will give testimony of the kingdom of God. I believe they're Elijah and Moses. And though when the Antichrist kills these two witnesses, God will raise them up three and a half days later. And then the seventh trumpet will sound. And then the proclamation will be made right when Jesus is about to come back. Now the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign. So just for reference, in my book, The Eternal Blueprint, I just want to highlight, uh, I'm, just, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into detail here, but in chapter 12, you can get a really good idea of my view of the kingdom of God. I'll quickly just summarize it is the kingdom of God is entered at salvation. It is, pro, it is embodied as we have, because we have Christ in dwelling life. It's exhibited as we obey the Sermon on the Mount. It's proclaimed as we preach the gospel of the kingdom. It's demonstrated as we operate in God's miraculous resurrection power. And the kingdom of God is advanced through prayer, preaching, and, and missions, and spiritual warfare as we function as salt and light in the culture. And so what I believe that the scriptures teach is the kingdom of God begins within a people during the church age, this present age we live in. It, the kingdom of God is beginning within us. It's being formed within us. Uh, the Christ is being established within us. His nature, his virtues, his character is being formed within us. And then his kingdom will expand into the seven mountains of culture when he comes back. And it will go into every area of society and culture when he reigns on the earth, literally. And it will, it, his kingdom will never, ever stop expanding and advancing um, forever. Anyway, yeah, I just encourage you, read uh, chapter 12 of the Eternal Blueprint, and you can see there what I'm talking about. Number nine is the catalyst for Jesus' return is a transformed bride, not transformed nations. And that is a huge distinction that I want to draw our attention to is Jesus, the catalyst for Jesus' return 
is a transformed bride, not transformed nations. Jesus is not waiting in heaven until we, the church, go out and transform the nations. Jesus is waiting in heaven until the kingdom of God is formed within us. See, before the kingdom of God is going to come and conquer the nations, the kingdom of God must first conquer the self-life. I mean, how many of us realize, I mean, that is a lifelong battle for the kingdom of God to, to, be, to conquer our self-life, to conquer our lust and our jealousy and our, ambition, our selfish ambition, our envy, our, our judgment, our criticism, and to form the meekness of Christ and the, the heart of God, the humility of Christ within us. I talk about this again in the Eternal Blueprint in chapter 12, but the kingdom of God, what does it look like when it's established within a people? It is, it, I believe Revelation 14, 5 is a beautiful scripture. It says they follow the lamb wherever he goes. When a people have been conquered by, the, by, the, by Christ the King and we become the embodiment of the kingdom of God, then we follow the Lamb wherever He goes. That means all pride and presumption and uh, rebellion and independence have been crucified and the Lamb's nature has been formed within us and we follow Him wherever He goes. And just for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through everything here I've got on page 6, but just encourage you to go read the notes and all that, that I talk about there is, uh, you know, talking about the Sermon on the Mount and what it looks like when the Sermon on the Mount is formed within us. And so let me just say this, is the American church, the American church yearns to permeate the nations and impact the culture with Christianity, but we won't even allow the Spirit of God to impact our own hearts. See, we, we were so eager to go out out there, and we do need to go out there. I'm not saying we don't, we do. But we're so eager to impact the culture and impact society and all this, these seven mountains of culture. We're so eager to go out there and impact that without having the kingdom of God first formed in us. I mean, what really impact can we have of the kingdom of God if the nature of the Lamb is not formed within us? You know, I just, I just think about this as is honestly, you know, just thinking about this, the, the seven mountain mandate teaching has been probably going on for 20, 30, 40 years. But it's really in the past 20 years, the, the, the seven mountain mandate has grown in great momentum. And, you know, I just, I'm not, I'm not trying, again, I'm not trying to be sarcastic or anything, but just, just honestly, I mean, how, how well is that going? You know, for the past 20 years, we've talked about, that the kingdom of God is to conquer and take dominion over the seven mountains of culture. But just think, look at our nation. Is our nation is at the lowest point in terms of morality, likely in our history. You know, abortion at an all-time high. They legalized homosexual marriage. I mean, just the nation is, you know, the greatest division in America since the Civil War. And again, I'm not trying to be, you know, cute or snarky or whatever. But maybe it's because our focus is not fully in alignment with God's focus, is we're so focused on the kingdom of God being established out there without the kingdom of God being established in here. And, and again, once the kingdom of God is established in here, and I'm not saying perfection by any means, I'm not saying any kind of perfection. We'll all, we will, the, the kingdom of God will ever be increasing, ever be in conquering us internally. But how much of a kingdom impact can we truly make when internally the kingdom is not formed in us. So I think maybe we need to reevaluate that before we can really function as salt and light, that we need the kingdom of God established within us. Maybe we need to go back to the Sermon on the Mount and see once again what Jesus was emphasizing in the Sermon on the Mount. I think one of the things I want to highlight here is the, the real clear distinction between what we teach in the Forerunner School and what Seven Mountain teachers are teaching, the real clear distinction is God's primary purpose for this age. God's primary purpose for this age is not to transform the nations. It's to transform his people internally. And again, 
I say it again, I'm not, I'm not, that does not minimize our need to be salt and light. But the primary mandate God has in this age, before he comes back, is for his kingdom to be established within his people. That's the major difference between God's eternal purpose and the seven mountain mandate. God wants to form Jesus Christ within his people. God wants to form us into the nature of the Lamb. God wants us to be a bride who's made herself ready. Jesus, when he comes back, that'll be the time for the bride to take dominion over the nations, but that'll come after our wedding, not before, not before. Now, again, you know, after 20 years of Seven Mountain teaching, I would expect some measure of cultural transformation, but maybe God wants us to look more of, of having the kingdom of God formed within us before we go out to impact the culture out there. So anyway, one of the main reasons I spend so much time in this, I want to bring it down to this point, is I believe the bride of Christ is not called to take dominion over all the nations so Jesus can return, but rather the bride is to make herself ready for the bridegroom so Jesus can return. It's the bride's readiness that determines Jesus' return, not the transformation of nations. And so, you know, you think about this. This is something we need to think about is um, the kingdom test. Is Jesus was taken by Satan into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness and he was tested. And the, and the enemy said to him, all the kingdoms of this world I will give to you if you will bow down and serve me. And Jesus said, Jesus rebuked him and said, get away from me, Satan. I will worship no other God but, but my Father. And I'm paraphrasing. But the point is this. Jesus was offered an earthly kingdom, and he resisted it. My concern is the church is going after a kingdom of, on this earth that comes before the cross, that comes before the self-life being crucified. See, this is where I believe, this is where I believe um, we got to be very careful. Is Satan offered Jesus the kingdom before the cross, the crown before crucifixion? And I believe he's offering the church the very same thing. I will give you the kingdoms of this world before the cross, and I will give you the kingdoms of this world before crucifixion. And so God wants to, well, I believe God's, God's priority is so vastly different. He wants to form Christ within us. He wants to bring the cross internally within us. And so I think God wants us to come back. That's, I guess, how I'll end this session. God wants us to come back to his primary purpose for this age. And that's to form Christ within a people. That's to form the nature of the Lamb within a people. And so I'll just conclude this session by saying just there's a lot of material, a lot of information here. But just go back and really dig into the notes and dig into the, you know, even if you have to listen to it again, just get this in your heart. Just study it for yourself. I'm not trying to make you believe like I believe. Just, you know, I just encourage you, just go and ask the Lord to teach you by the Spirit. Even if, you know, this is such a great year, 2021, not a great year so far, but it is a great year for us to evaluate what we have believed and to say, God, are there things you want to change? Have I believed a doctrine that's not scriptural? Have I believed a, a doctrine of demons? Have I believed a wrong view of eschatology. Lord, show me the truth. This is a great year to really get below, uh, below or before the Lord, humbling ourselves and saying, Lord, you teach me. I want to encourage you just to do that. Ask the Lord to be your teacher. Ask the Holy Spirit to be your teacher. Even take what I've written here and just, just ask the Lord to guide you into all the truth. Amen.